Welcome to recording number four of the benefits of being an octopus. We're going to pick up where we left off in chapter four on page 35. Okay, Google, start a timer for 15 minutes. 15 minutes starting now. Come on, Brendan Farley is saying. That was definitely the best play of the game. Did you see the look on that receiver's face when he dropped the ball? Priceless. Calvin Umbator shakes his head. No way, man. It was the Pats' hurry-up offense in the third quarter. The Colts' defensive line didn't know what was coming at them. Matt, with his trumpet-playing lungs, quiets them all down. You're all wrong. The best play of the game was clearly the fumble on that third down in the first quarter. And that's because... He pauses for dramatic effect. Because the Colts weren't, were in field goal position, I mumble into my desk. The sudden silence around me is the kind that makes, makes me lift my head without thinking. And there is Matt Hubbard looking right at me. Exactly, he says. He's still looking at me. My octopus chromatophores don't always listen to me. Suddenly that oh-so-awesome camouflage skin has turned bright red and pimply all over. Chapter 5. The social studies and science interdisciplinary block arrives like a slow motion steamroller. The wall between the social studies and science classrooms has been opened. I'm on the social studies side because that's the class I would usually have now, but at least I can see the tank of hermit crabs on the science side. They could use a cleaning. I'm signed up for extra help in science during the special ACE period on Wednesdays because I don't do homework in that class either. But it's okay because Mr. Peck lets me spend the, the period cleaning the tanks. They're usually filthy. I figure he's the one who needs the extra help. Let's get cracking, Ms. Rochambeau calls out. I want to see nothing on your desk except your debate packet. I'll be coming around to check. Around me, everyone moves in a flurry, clearing off their desks to leave only their beautiful, filled out, remembered packets. Octopuses can squish can squish their bodies down to no bigger than a crumpled up bag of chips. By the time Ms. Rochambeau gets to my desk, I might as well be that balled up bag with all the chip bits eaten, ready to be tossed into the trash. Ms. Rochambeau raises her eyebrows when she gets to me. Not in a, how clever to ball up like a little bag of chips way, but in that you have disappointed me with your very being way that teachers are so good at. She shakes her head as she writes my zero into her grade book. Sometime, Zoe, I hope you surprise me. I forgot it at home, I say to my desk. I promise I finished it. Mm-hmm, she murmurs. It doesn't do you any good at home, unfortunately. She pretends she believes me. I pretend I don't want to squirt octopus ink all over this classroom. Maybe I could be in the debate anyway, I say, even though she's already moved on to the next kid. I know all my facts. She doesn't look up from the other kid's packet. Then you should have brought your filled out packet so I could see that. I was very clear in my expectations. Having to sit and watch everyone else is even worse than getting Mrs. Ro Ms. Rochambeau's raised eye of eyebrow of disappointment. Calvin Umbator mumbles through his opening statement about the terrifying Tyrannosaurus Rex, reading directly from his packet. Then Matt Hubbard is up. He stands up like he's been waiting his whole life for the opportunity to address the combined social studies and science classes. My friends, the best animal on this earth is clearly the orca. Did I make up, did I make that whole Matt agreeing with me in homeroom thing up? Did that even happen? Because part of me feels like I shouldn't be allowed to think the name Matt Hubbard, or at least that if I do, Angry flying Vikings will show up and beat me over the head with wooden swords, yelling, not worthy, because he's the whole package, like an all expenses paid trip to Disney World package. And I'm nothing like that. Maybe I'm the stub of an already used bus ticket, specifically the bus that my dad took to get away from us. And even then, I'm the ticket stub that's at the back of the bus with the muddy boot marks all over it. But he did talk to me, didn't he? And he looked at me like he could see me and like he respected my amazing analysis of the Patriots game. Because it was amazing, wasn't it? They are fierce predator predators that can swim up to 30 miles per hour, Matt is proclaiming. He definitely isn't reading off his packet like Calvin was. 
Orcas work together in teams to take down their prey. And he raises his finger in the air. They will share the meat with the whole pod. In a flash, he produces a giant bag of Swedish fish and starts passing them out. He keeps up his presentation over the joyful squeals as people get handfuls of candy fish delivered to their desks. I pop one in my mouth. It's delicious. How could I, could I have actually competed with this? And they're camouflaged. Their black back blends in with the ocean as if someone is looking with the ocean. If someone is looking down on them and their white belly blends in with the sky if someone is looking up. But two colors are nothing compared to the octopus's con constantly changing camouflage, right? And you're all eating fish right now, but they hunt and eat a wide variety of animals, including the seal, the sea lion, the stingray, the squid, and the octopus. Right. I stop eating the Swedish fish. Next, Kaylee Vine stands up. Her shirt says, I'm watching you. And it's got a picture of an owl with giant eyes. And it fits her perfectly, like all of her clothes do. Owls are the best animal. They're wise, and they have these things called light rods in their eyes. So they can see every single leaf on a tree in the middle of the night. And they can rotate their head more than 180 degrees so that they can see everything around them. There's something about the way Kaylee looks around at everyone that makes me think that she might be able to rotate her head more than 180 degrees too. Under her watch, no detail goes unnoticed. I realize my shirt has slipped to the side and I fix it. The downsides of a growth spurt mean that my mom insists on buying clothes that are two sizes too big for me when she's at the consignment store. Their wings have a special pattern of interlocked feathers so that they can fly silently through the air, Kaylee is saying. She isn't reading off of her packet either. I wouldn't have needed to look at my packet. I know my octopus back's cold. But still, Kaylee is saying this stuff not like only has she, like not only has she known it all her life, but like everyone with half a brain would know it too. My leg starts twitching just imagining what it'd be like to be standing up there talking. Everyone would be looking at me, even the owl on Kaylee's shirt. This means they can sneak up on unsuspecting chipmunks and grab them with their sharp talons. And before you get all upset about the chipmunks, you should know they're actually helping the chipmunk, po chipmunk population. The strong chipmunks know how to take care of themselves. The owls are weeding out the ones who don't. And that's better for everyone. I'm pretty sure it's not a coincidence that she looks straight at me when she says this. Because if you can take care of yourself, you'd have clean clothes and you wouldn't smell like cigarette smoke and you definitely remember your debate packet. And how is it fair for the kids who are on top of stuff to have to share the classroom with kids who aren't? And Calvin, I want you to know that I'll be coming for you and your T-Rex's tiny little brain when we get to the Q&A part of this debate. If I had remembered my packet and made the mistake of getting up there, that owl on Kaylee's shirt would be full on rolling its giant eyes at me along with everyone else by this point. Did I really think Kaylee Vine was going to be impressed with my octopus facts? Did I really think that she was going to give me a pass when the whole point of the debate is to prove everyone else wrong? It's not enough to know your stuff. Not if one of the things you know for sure is that everyone you're going up against is better than you. Chapter six. After the school bus drops me off, I zip up my jacket and walk as quick as I can along the shoulder of Route 3. If I can get to the pizza pit before Bryce and Aurora's Head Start bus shows up, I can steal my favorite five minutes of the day. A logging truck, a truck whizzes past me, and I squint to block the spray of icy slush it kicks up from the road. My mom's lucky to have this job. It's not as much money as the fancy place she worked in the tiny little mountain town of Peru, Vermont, where all the skiers came, but you can't keep a job like that if your car doesn't start when it's cold out. Plus, people eat at the pizza pit year-round, and we can walk there from the trailer. When I arrive and push open the door, it's Connor who's holding Hector. They're standing just behind the pink neon open sign that's flashing on and off. Hector is giggling every time it turns on. Ricky, the boss, has said it's okay if Hector's around a bit. Says he, says he makes it feel like a real family restaurant, just as long as he doesn't cry or make a mess, and only if it's during the half hour that my mom's and Connor's shifts overlap. And even though everything else would be easier if my mom's shift started a half an hour later, 
so she didn't have to schlep him there until I could take over, I'd miss getting to see Hector and Connor together. Hey Zoe, Connor says as soon as he sees me. How was school today? He's smiling his regular giant smile. No one in the world could have a smile as great as Connor's. Where's my mom? I ask, reaching to take Hector from him. Do you need to take care of that table? Connor glances over at the booth people. Oh, they're fine. They've been here for hours and they've got their check already. They don't need me. Connor reaches out and tickles Hector, who's now squirming in my arms, trying to get back to Connor. But your mom needed me, didn't she, Mr. Cutie Pie? Because someone went and sped up all over her uniform and she had to go change. Was that you? I say to Hector. My voice sounds awkward, mimicking Connor's happy bubbliness. But Hector's eyes are wide and he keeps giggling. I'm pretty sure I usually talk to him like my mom does. Mostly tired. Here. Connor gestures over to one of the booths. Take a load off. I'll get you a water with lemon. I settle onto the padded seat of the booth with Hector on my lap. He reaches for the rolled up napkin of silverware and instantly throws it on the floor. I'm sorry, I say to Connor when he comes back over. No worries, he says, pocketing the silverware roll and the small black apron around his waist. There are more where that came from. He sets down one ice water with a slice of lemon perfectly placed on top of the glass far enough away so it's out of Hector's reach, and one spoon close by. That's for you, Mr. Cutie Pie, he says, pointing to the spoon, and the water is for your awesome older sister. Thank you, I say. I take a drink of the water while Hector is distracted by the spoon. I try to sneak a peek at Connor's tattoos. Ricky makes him wear a long sleeve shirt under the standard black polo uniform, but you can still see the edges of them peeking out from the sleeve. He showed them to me once. There was the one that looked like a cross with another cross inside it that he said he'd gotten when he was hiking around Peru, like the country Peru, not Peru, the tiny town where our car wouldn't start. Connor made it all the way to a place where January is summertime. So now, Connor says, <coughs> sliding into the seat across from me, let's get down to business. Which is better, an igloo with a marshmallow roasting fire pit or a tree house in the jungle, but you can only eat nuts. I lean back against the booth and bite back a smile. The tree house in the jungle. Connor raises his eyebrows. Just nuts? I like nuts. He grins. Okay, what have you got for me? Let's see. I close my eyes. You have to walk across town when everything is black ice, but you get to eat warm chocolate chip cookies the whole time. Or it's a beautiful day, but you have to spend it being chased by angry squirrels. Connor laughs out loud. Oh, what a choice, Zoe. He considers for a minute. Squirrels are fast. I'll take the cookies instead, and I'll ice skate the whole way. Best five minutes of the day. My mom comes out of the bathroom a few minutes later. She's kind of frazzled, still fixing her hair and stuff, but it's clear she already switched over to work, mo work mode mom. I like getting to sneak peeks at her waitressing, the way she can fly out of the kitchen carrying multiple plates of steaming pasta, the way she pushes buttons on the cash register like a boss, the way she writes down customers' orders and this cool magical code and can do it without ever looking away from the customer. It's like waitressing is the one time when the competent mom I remember comes back and says hello. She hands me the diaper bag. At least there was an extra uniform shirt in there. You can't see the spots on my pants, right? Her black pants look the same as ever. I shake my head. Good. She turns to Connor. Okay, what other prep work do I need to get done before the dinner rush? I was able to mix up two of the salad dressings, but I didn't have time to get to the ranch yet, Connor says as they push past the doors into the kitchen. I look over at the table where Matt Hubbard's family always sits on their Friday night dinners, or Saturday night dinners. Matt and his mom and his dad and his little sister, just like in a commercial. His sister is a few grades younger than us. She has some fancy name like Emmeline or Eleanor, or maybe it's just Emily, but she looked fancy and smart because she was always winning things just like Matt in elementary school. The, bat, the spelling bee, the art contest for Earth Day, all that stuff. I bet they make up new contests just so the Hubbards can win them. Like last week in Homeroom, when Mr. Bontaff made this whole big deal about how Matt had done such an amazing job for his trumpet solo in the jazz band concert about how it was magnificent and amazing. I can't even imagine having a teacher saying things like that about me. 
But even though I don't do after school activities like he does, and even though I'm grimy, he still talked to me this morning. And he still gave me Swedish fish, even though I didn't have my debate packet like everyone else. And he has really nice brown eyes. Zoe, what are you still doing here? My mom bursts back through the kitchen doors. Bryce and Aurora will be getting off the bus any second. I look at the clock on the wall. Shoot. And that's time. We'll pick up here next time.